Ladies and gentlemen, saints and ain'ts, welcome to another episode of The Bigger Picture at the Throne Room. And today we have the pleasure and the honor of P. Supreme Jr., the son of Mr. Supreme Kenneth McGriff. How are you this evening? I'm amazing. I'm amazing. Thank you for having me. Thank you so it's much. It's an honor. For, it's an honor for I you love to be this, here. I love this decor and the ambiance and the setup. I wish I was sitting on a throne chair, but it's okay. It's, it's cool. No, this is the throne cool. for one. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. This is throne for one. I just act like this is the a throne, a white throne. Well, actually, that is the seat of the esteemed. So anyone that sits in that chair is mostly honored. It's not the hot seat, is it? It is not okay, the hot cool. seat. There are no seats here with temperatures. That Got is you. the esteemed and respected seat. And you are most welcome to be in it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. So let's start from the beginning. I've done some research and I know that you are not only what the picture shows, you actually had a parochial school education. Absolutely. The, from the very, very beginning, from pre-K, I was in Catholic school. So I had like a strict upbringing. It was very structured. It was very like, you know, I, I never got out of bounds. I never strayed away. Like my mom had a vision for me and she wanted to make sure like I didn't stray away from her vision of what she wanted. You know, it, it, it worked out, I think, because, you know, people tell me I'm well versed, I'm, you know, intellectual and all those things. But, you know, sometimes whether it's a parent or a friend or whoever, sometimes their vision for you isn't the vision that's for you. You get what I'm saying? But I definitely feel like, yeah, since a, a pre-K, I was in private school, Catholic school. Have you ever been to a public school setting? I wouldn't be able, no. I wouldn't even be able to tell you where public school was, how it looks on the inside. <laughs> Never. Well, as a parochial school educated person also from kindergarten all the way up to 10th grade where I was expelled from a very all girls prestigious Catholic school. I can say you didn't miss a damn thing from my school. You know, you know what's a funny thing too? I never, even, I never even told a lot of people this. I, ha I didn't see a project building inside of a project building until I was probably around 16, 17. I didn't even see the inside of a project building until I was 16 or 17. Take us to that moment. What was that like? It was cool. <laughs> like liked, an adventure? I, yeah, it's like something, you know, something that you've never seen before. It's like, hmm, like the pissy hallways, the pissy elevators, the graffiti on the wall, the writings on the wall. Like, I'm like, this ain't, this ain't so bad, you know? The sights and the smells. Yeah. And the sounds. The three S's. <laughs> oh, it's, we missing one, but I don't want to say that on camera. <laughs> You can. This is a free forum and a safe space, so that is absolutely fine. Tell me one of the best things about your childhood. Um, I had a lot of fun growing up. Being like in the city, I loved it. A kid in the city is just like a, a kid in the candy store, really. Like, it's just so much to do, so much to see. I'm a sightseer, like a lot of... <clears throat> <clears throat> a lot of people don't know about me either. Like I'm a, a big, like sightseer, and like I love being outside. I love walking into new things, new discoveries, and like that's the city for you. Mm -hmm. My school was right around the corner from Times Square, so it was like I would leave out of my school and just be right in the middle of the mecca. So it's like you know, it was amazing. I loved getting out of school, traveling, walking in the city from Times Square. My mother was um, working on 34th Street, so that radius right there is like the Mecca. It's fast, hustle and bustle, like I loved it. I loved it, but um, my friends, you know, the, the people I grew up with, they was cool. I was mostly the only person from Queens going to the school mm. in the city, so it was like, you know, like they had to fill me out a little bit before they embraced me, mm -hmm. but it didn't take long because you know, I have that uh, addictive personality. I feel like people just gravitate towards me, whether whatever reason it, it, it is, but they do. 
So I didn't really have a hard school time, you know? Some kids might get bullied. Some kids might, you know, go through a rough spell. Some kids' grades might not be good. I was like, school was my thing until mm. it wasn't my thing. Mm. Did you play sports? Yeah, or baseball. Active? My baseball. whole life. What position? I was left field and center field. Nice. Yeah, my whole nice, life. Nice, yeah. nice, nice. I, I tried to be like Derek G didn't play uh, shortstop, but um, yeah, I, they, they put me in the outfield. <laughs> it's okay. You were active. You was involved. You mm -hmm. was engaged. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of character development that comes with sports, especially when you're coming from a very structured educational environment, such as parochial school. If a person never been to parochial school, they don't understand what that structure is like, mm -mm. where failure is not an option. Mm -mm. Um, that you're not only living up to the expectations of your parents, but the expectation of the culture of the school. Excellence is the expectation. Absolutely. And I can clearly see that demonstrated in your articulation, your posture, and the way you present yourself. So gold star to your mom for making that happen. Definitely. Definitely. Hats off to mama love. Absolutely. So when you would come home from school, who's home? Because mom's a career woman. Was it just you and your mom? Just Do you have mom, siblings? Was, it, no siblings. It was just me and her. And my, my grandmother stayed in the basement for to probably like I was maybe 10. Then she moved into her own spot. But yeah, it's just me and my mother. And I would sneak downstairs to the basement um, Saturday early Saturday mornings because my grandmother would make me breakfast. And I didn't want to go to the mall with my mother. Because I know if I was at that mall with her, we would be there all day. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not trying to do that. So I would sneak downstairs and then my, my mother would call my grandmother, he up. And I'd be like this to my grandmother. Like, so my grandmother <laughs> would laugh at me and say, nah, he's asleep. And, you know, she would go to the mall and be gone. And me and my grandmother, that's my, my dog. So, Those are your rocks. Yeah. Those are your rocks, the mountains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that you I like how you, I like that they, they the mountains. Yeah. Exactly, exactly mm -hmm. the mountains. What was your concept of a father at that time? My mother, yeah, my mother, and my grandmother, all the men were gone. Mm -hmm. I, I tell I tell people that all the time, like, you know, um, TV. That's like when when fathers leave so early on and. A, a boy's life, I feel like the father figures become characters, like mm -hmm. maybe a TV character, maybe um, a, a coach on your team, maybe a co-worker of your mother, but like it's not one 24-7. So your mom and your grandmother or your aunts or your cousins become they all like got to pour in and they all, all that poured in becomes the, the male figure, I guess, or whatever we deem as a male figure. So, yeah. And I think a lot of young men, especially the 90s babies can relate to that because during the 90s, which was Giuliani time, Pataki mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. um, we watched an entire generation removed not just from the blocks, but from the community, from the homes, from the mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. And there were children that were left. Behind, yep. And um, that left definitely a hole. Mm -hmm. And I, don't, I think a lot of young men can absolutely relate to that because that has been their experience. Space, am I looking here or at her? Okay, got you. We can edit that out. <laughs> It's cool. It's cool. Mm -hmm. um, when you think about that period, if there was, was there a moment where you started to think about a dad, a father? Um. No, I don't even. I never. I never felt felt like, you know, they, they, that famous saying, "You you can't miss what you never had," or. Right. You know, so I never really, like I said, my grandmother was my best friend, so, mm -hmm. and I had people to kind of keep my mind off of it, like my mm -hmm. friends or like, 
you know, family members, like I, you know, you can't miss what you never had. So I don't really feel like I was one of those people that was like, mom, when's dad's coming home? Or mom, when's my uncle? Like, I never was like that. I just was loving life. I was enjoying my life. Like even from a young kid, I never, I, I really never let too much discourage me or like get me down. Like I never, like when people tell me, talk to me about depression and stuff like that, like I'm empathetic to them because I can understand where somebody's coming from. Like I can remove myself and understand them, but I need people to break that down for me, like depression and anxiety, because I don't really think I ever dealt with that. Mm. Like I had a, I can't say I had a hard grown upbringing, childhood, like I had, my mother gave me everything I needed and wanted. So it was kind of like, I didn't really want for anything. You weren't missing any parts. I didn't feel like, I didn't feel, I didn't feel like I was missing anything to probably teenage years. But I mean, now my uncles and all of them is coming home. So like, as soon as mm -hmm. I felt like I, I feel like God always protected me or like kept me sane because the moment I felt like I needed a male figure, my uncles started coming home. I started mm -hmm. being around my male cousins more. I started so like anytime a void was happening, it would always automatically just be filled. So, yeah. In God's time, divine time, mm -hmm. at the time you needed it, not at the time you, you wanted, wanted it. it. Exactly. Excellent, excellent. Exactly. What was that experience like when you were introduced to your father, who he was, the power that was connected with him, some of the subtle and not so subtle hatred, you know, from the naysayers? Mm -hmm the outsiders, and some insiders. What was that like? That's, an, that's another thing that I never really felt like, um, the hatred mm -hmm. or like the negative aspects or connotations that's associated with him. I never really felt the brunt of that either. Like it always was admiration and reverence and love. Mm -hmm. And like, I never heard anybody say anything bad about him. Like literally, I never heard any from my mom to family to his peers to people in the streets that knew who I was to the barbers to the trash men to I never heard anybody say anything bad about him. So I'm just like, he was just like a um a polarizing figure. He was almost like a superhero. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't really know superheroes. Like you just see them on TV mm -hmm. or you hear about them. Mm -hmm. So like he was like one of those type of figures. And then... When I um, found out who he was, was, I tell that story every time, on, all the time, um, the famous barbershop story, but I was going to the barbershop and his friends would, you know, talk to me and give me money and take me shopping and all that stuff. And, you know, I asked my, came home and asked my mother, who's this guy that keeps saying I'm his son? Like, why did everybody keep saying that? They giving me like, and then she broke it down for me. She explained it. But when I finally had a conversation, our first conversation was just like, smiles and cheeses mm -hmm. like because I'm talking to the superhero that everybody was telling me about mm -hmm. so that was that first encounter and first interaction Super, I'm talking to a superhero mm -hmm. and how often do we get that opportunity in this life not a lot not a lot it's very scarce and rare superheroes are mystical figures mm -hmm. they're revered in so many ways but there's not too many that get up close and personal that mm -hmm. really see the woman or the man of the superhero without all the accolades. I mean, I feel like our moms are superheroes too. Absolutely. But in the regards and the the uh, and relate with how it relates to him, yeah, it was it was cool knowing that my dad was this person. This is does it feel feel cool now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. It definitely does. I, I think I think some feelings is never going to stop. It's never going to go away. Like, yeah. I think when children are very powerful, men in particular, um, we don't have too many um, historical instances of powerful women that are revered in that way. Not in modern times, mm -hmm. you know maybe in the arts or in entertainment, but not in business. Mm -hmm. um, I think children of very powerful men, there's almost a catch-22. 
because there is such an expectation. But the expectation and the participation don't always align. Mm -hmm. And the world is very judgmental. Absolutely. And ignorant of what that experience is really like. I feel like ignorant is the perfect word for the world. <laughs> we agree. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But um, yeah, that's a burden. It's a it's a humongous burden. And it's overwhelming. I tell people that all the time, like, yo, you and you know another thing that I, I don't like when people say, Oh, if I was in your position or if that was my fault, like I bro, find that so bro, despicable. Bro, you don't you don't want my life, bro. My life is amazing, don't get me wrong. Right. But you couldn't handle what I've been through in my life. Like, stop, bro. God made you that person's son for a reason. He knew that I would be able to deal with it and know how to handle being this person's son because, yeah, but you cut it out. Be happy that your father was a post office worker. Correct. Respectfully. Respectfully. And be some people say I'm arrogant. Like when I no, I, I'm just gonna break it down to the simplest form so you can understand what I'm saying. Cause if I, you know, like you're not gonna get it. So I have to break it down for you like that. And I have to be animated when I'm telling you too. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you when people, I hate when people tell me that. Man, you supposed to be this, or you, you man, I wish. Stop wishing, because it's not going to come true. So you might as well stop wishing. My nana used to say, wish in one hand, shit in the other. <laughs> That's not like a down south saying my grandmother would have said. Hey, she's from the south. Yeah. I think it's um almost a subtle and quiet jealousy. Definitely. And sometimes it's not so subtle, because um to say if... If that was mine, but it's not. That's that's like that's very envious. It's very it it shows mm -hmm. exactly the energy that's coming with that statement. Because the truth of the matter is, all powerful fathers' children have the same dynamic, S securing their own, mm -hmm. especially if. That parent was successful in the underground economy. I like to call it the underground economy because that's what it is. That's the first time I heard that one. That's what it is. That's the. That's what it is. That's it's the first an economy, time I, the underground economy. There's profits. There's losses. There's supply. There's demand. There's organization. I love that. Okay. That was that was it that is, was smooth. That's what it is. Underground economy. The catches. The other families and the generations before, particularly the Italians and the Irish, mm -hmm. was able to transition that money into the longevity. Business. Mm -hmm. Businesses. Right? Yep. And the seizures wasn't as diligent as they became when our people began to accumulate wealth in the same way. Of course. Of course. There's no difference in pharmaceutical sales than there was in prostitution and bootlegging. It's the same. Exactly. Clientele is the same. Mm -hmm. There wouldn't be a record industry without the underground economy. Because let's be honest, the servants, the railroad workers, the domestics, they were, did not have the means to invest in those businesses. Exactly. People that had the means to invest in those businesses. Was the people in the underground economy. Exactly. <laughs> so I think, you know, when people pass judgment, and don't treat it with the same respect as mm. any other business. Mm -hmm. I think it's very foolish. Yeah. This mm -hmm. is America. We were built on criminality. I, I repeated this um, when I interviewed um, Sean Bega. Uh, the Boston Tea Party wasn't full of waltz and violins. Mm -hmm. It was a gangster, kick behind, open rebellion. And that's why in America we love guns. And violence. And violence, street culture. And we cheer and on the bad guy. Yeah. I love villains. <laughs> we love I the love villains. villains. You see what? who I got tattooed on my hand? <laughs> I love villains. Oh. And he is a very dichotomous villain as well, the Joker. People, people um, when I was younger, people used to like compare me to him. Why is that? I have no idea. But if I was to give... An answer for them, mm -hmm. because he came up in the chaos, mm -hmm. 
he understood chaos and he knew how to manipulate chaos, mm. right? So I feel like it was almost a compliment when they, you know, because he's a smart man. Very. Because a fool, a, a, a smart man can play a fool, but a fool can't play a smart man. So I feel like the Joker is like that, and I feel like that's that's also me. Mm-hmm. So, and everything is a, is a, is a motive behind everything, like very strategic. Mm-hmm. You know, he just knows how to. He's just very meticulous. Like I feel like it's not a bad thing to be called the Joker. Some people might take it as an insult, but I didn't t- never look at it as an insult. Like I, yeah, I am. Hmm. Do you feel like the Joker today? Yeah, I, I, I don't think I, um, I definitely evolved and matured. Mm-hmm. But you know, they say, um, you never, you never, uh, stray too far away from what you are. Mm-hmm. So yeah, very chaotic. But I know how to control the chaos, though. Mm-hmm. What is chaos to you? Chaos is. You know, pushing people's buttons, mm. letting people push your buttons to a certain extent. Um, chaos is, you know, uh, seeing the world and not accepting it, but understanding it and know how to maneuver it. New maneuver in it. Chaos is, you know, um, not burning in the fire, mm. but illuminating in the fire. Chaos is is very, I think chaos is, is necessary. Mm-hmm. Chaos is def. I think, yeah, chaos is definitely necessary. Without chaos, I don't think we would know what nirvana is. Exactly. Exactly. That's like yin and yang. Mm-hmm. And I, got, I, also, I also have that tattooed on me too, the yin and the yang. Because everything in life is yin and the yang. You got good, you got bad, you got... Mm-hmm. Tall, you got short. You got everything in life is yin and yang. Everything. That's the balance. Everything in life is about the yin and yang. That's good. What are some of the lessons you learned before you met your dad that you still hold dear now? None. I think I think once I met him, once we started talking, I feel like that's when all the lessons started happening. I don't really feel like I had any like lessons or teachings that stuck with me. Mm. But once I met him, it felt like everything just made sense made sense. Mm. Like I'm not like, matter of fact, let me I learned how to be a, a generous human mm. from my mother. My mother was very given to a lot of people. She was very like, take the shirt off her back and give it to somebody. She was very like um, she was like a sacrificial person. Like she would sacrifice herself for somebody else. So that's a lesson I learned. Not to 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 know how to be used, but not be misused. Because mm-hmm. I watched people misuse her. So she didn't know how to kind of like differentiate being used and being misused. So me just observing what was going on. That's a lesson I learned. To to know that, you know, being used is not a bad thing. Just don't let nobody misuse you. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the things that stuck with me. Definitely. And from your dad, was one of the lessons you've learned that you still hold and practice today? Never be too trusting. Mm. Never be too, too never be too trusting because um every smiling face isn't really uh a, every smiling face isn't really happy for you. Mm-hmm. You know, when hyenas are in motion of attack, it sounds like they're, they're laughing, laughing mm-hmm. and smiling. Mm-hmm. And um, I think a lot of that goes over a lot of heads. It does. That you have to watch the eyes. The eyes never lie. Mm-hmm. The smile can be as bright as a GE bulb. 100 watt, <laughs> but those eyes are as dead as a fish on the side of the road. One million percent. Very important One million lessons. percent. Um, what is the dominant untruth that people believe about you? That's just completely untrue. 
Mm. That's a good one. That's a good one. Um, dominant untruth. I mean, you know, I, I'm not. I'm not really one of those people that, uh, for lack of a better term, read the comments. Mm -hmm. Like, it doesn't. It doesn't phase me because I know who I am. Mm -hmm. I know I'm comfortable with my skin. You know, um, what is what is uh? I don't know. I think. I think people's perception of me. Mm -hmm. Is I help give them that perception based upon how I choose to talk or act in a certain space or a particular time or or a certain interview or a certain post. But I but like I said, I know how to control the chaos. Like I feel like if you're basing your assessment of me on what I project or what I put out, then you playing right into my hands. Because I can be this person Monday and be this person Tuesday and be this person Wednesday, and then your brain is going to, oh, you're going to explode because you can't keep up with me. Mm. So I, I like, you know, I just like playing with people sometimes. But um, I can't, I'm, I gotta, I'm a, let me, you gotta let me think about that. That was a good, that, Come back to that was, that was, that was, that was a one from, that was a curveball right there. I like that one. <laughs> I, I like that one. That was a good one. Um, yeah, I got, we got to come back to that one. Maybe ask me that at the end of this. I'll have it. Uh, we'll come answer. back to it. Yeah, but we'll I love that question, though. What are you most proud of in this moment? Being alive. Mm -hmm. Being alive. Um, just, I feel like every year I'm transcending, I'm progressing, I'm evolving. So, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're in the same place you was five years ago, no growth. You just wasted five years. So that's what I'm most proud of and just happy about now is just that I'm so young, but I'm mm. so, I have an old soul. Like my grandmother always, like her, her her people or her church friends or my mom and her, they always say, yo, even when I can always remember them saying this when I was a kid, like he got an old soul. Like he been here before. Like, you know, older mm. people always say that. So um, I just feel like, if somebody people love talking to me mm. because they say I, I'm a great listener and I give great advice. So I'm happy that I'm able to help people. And you know, I just I just like helping people, whether it can be with words, whether it can be with actions, whether I just like helping people. I like when people say, you know what, yo, you made a lot of sense. Like you just helped me out so much. Like, thank you. Mm. And I like when I'm walking in the street and a random person to say, God bless you. Like that means so much to me because like I just I just I just love hearing that. God I, it, it means a lot. Like the small things mean a lot to me. Mm. That's 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 a good answer to that question. Mm. People think that I'm I, I love the glitz and the glamour, mm. but it's really the small things that mean the most to me. The small gestures mean the most to me. So that, that's the answer to your question. We don't <laughs> gotta say that to the end. I think the smaller <laughs> gestures are more authentic. Mm -hmm. Than the ones that are, you know, grand. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the grander the gesture, the bigger the distraction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really cool. Tell me about the legacy you're building for yourself and your family now. Your plans. Yeah. Um. As far as legacy. Excuse me. I don't even think that. Um. Right now, in this particular moment. I fully understand legacy. Mm. Right now, this this spot that I'm in in my life right now, I'm just head down, just working. Pause. Mm. All the pauses out there. Um, yeah, I'm just working. Like, you know, sometimes you don't when you when you have a, a a mission or a goal or something that you're trying to get to. Like, if you, I feel like if you just get to work, mm -hmm. you're not gonna focus on what that thing is you're trying to get to or the process. If you just work, you just one day you'll see the finish line. Mm. So I'm not really so much worried about the finish line or a legacy. I'm just worried about the work in between, and then we can get to all that once you know, mm -hmm. once it's time for it. But I'm just focused on working right now. Working. Tell us, tell us about some of the projects you're working yeah, just, on. Yeah, just you know, now. just working. Um, I love constantly being on the camera. So, yeah, t t <laughs> um, t TV shows. Um, documentaries are in the works right now. I'm writing a book. Nice. 
Yeah, but um, I don't really have a release date for the book because I feel like every week or every month something else happens and I'm like, oh, I got to put that in the book too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm doing the clothing brand. I'm styling a lot of people, helping a lot of artists. I'm not, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm a manager, I'm a liaison. I, I broke a deal together. I'm, a, I'm like the ultimate middleman. Mm. Like I put so much, in a good way though, I put so much, I put a lot of things um, together and in motion that if I never told you I did that, you wouldn't even know. But I, some, you know, I like it like that. I want to have the mystique and I want to be in the camera. You get what I'm saying? But just because I'm in the camera don't mean I'm going to tell you about the mystique. So, you know, it's a lot of, lot of stuff I do behind the scenes. Um, yeah, just, I guess, you know, stay tuned, man. There's never a dull moment in my life, so the people will always be entertained. Never a dull moment. I think there's a piece that comes with being behind the scenes. Yeah. There is. Yeah, because I'm, I'm a person that has done both. I've been and. I like, I like directing more, mm. but I enjoy being in the camera more, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Because I'm made for the camera, like, you know? I'm just made for the camera. I could totally see you in front, but I do think you're insightful enough and mm -hmm. visual enough to be behind the camera as far as production. Balance. Yes, which is, which is a great balance. Mm -hmm. Um, hmm. put these three things in order love, power, respect put them in a hierarchy mm. I'm going to say power first mm -hmm. I'm going to say Mm. That respect and that love one always is like a hard one to kind of like put those two in like order. I'm definitely going to say power first. Mm. Um, and it, it's going to alternate for me. One day it might be love, one day, but I'm going to say, I'm going to say, just to answer your question, I'm going to say power, respect, and then love. Because mm. I, um, and, and the reason I put love Third is because, mm, matter of fact, ugh. these. Th how long did you think about these questions, man? These are some good questions. About ten minutes. See, see, my, because <laughs> <laughs> then I'm then I want to then I want to just retract that whole thing and put love first mm. because I love love, mm. and there's no love like real love and like oh man like. I have a lot of different personalities. I don't know if you could tell, <laughs> but yeah, one of but my. But you're not a Gemini. I, that's that's crazy. One, but one, one, of, one of my personalities is telling me that love is first, mm. right? And then my other personality is telling me that power is first. Mm. Maybe they're married. Because some people love power. Mm. So you know, and well, I think and the if power you have of power, love. or the power of love, yeah. So I think they do. Go hand in hand. And then respect, I feel like, I feel like, um, if somebody love you, they, they got to kind of respect you, right? Mm. I feel like if they love you, I don't really think you can respect somebody and not love them, you know? So it's I think weird. they would be polar opposites. You think so? I don't think you could love without respect. I think there's respect is definitely woven into the foundation of love. What's your what's your order? I can't tell you that. Why not? I tell oh, you only... my now my one is love. Okay. Love first. Okay. Love love conquers all. You want to love the... first. Okay. Absolutely love first. Yeah. Love nurtures everything else. Definitely. Without it, the power means nothing. You can't even enjoy it. You you're kind of slowly eroding because mm. power is not enough to sustain the soul. Mm. You, yo, let me tell you something. You deep. You deep. You, you, I, I, I love it. I'm glad I came. 
I'm glad I showed up because this you you drop you drop you dropping them jewels, man. What's the name? What's the name? The bigger picture. That's the name of this, right? The bigger yeah. picture. Because I feel like it can be so many different names. But I like the. I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm look. I'm directing right. I'm could... directing right now. My bad, man. I'm, I'm supposed to just be the. My bad. My bad. Maybe you'll come back and direct one of our episodes. Yeah. yeah That'll like, be awesome. I like that. That'll no. be really awesome. Yeah. You're going back to 1999. You can only bring back one thing. What do you bring back with you? If I'm right now and then I'm going back, what am I taking from 2023? What am I taking from 2023 and bringing it back there with me? No, you're going to 1999. And what am I bringing to the future? Yes. From 1999? Yes. Is there anything you would bring back? I mean, I was a a, a small, small, yeah. So I mean, yeah. So it's like. But what you have the knowledge you have now. Cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> cell phones. Cell phones. Yeah, cell phones. Without a doubt. Cell phones. Mm-hmm. Now, big day was in 1999. Yeah. yeah. They didn't even have calling plans then. I um, know, because those bills used to be crazy. It was per minute. I'm trying to think what I would bring from 99 to, to here. Mm. Yeah, I don't uh, it's a know. hard one. Yeah. You want to think about it when yeah. you leave like You hit me, you hit me with like mad haymakers, like mad haymaker questions. <laughs> hey, this one is an easy one. Okay, thank Be you. Be president for 30 days. Mm. Reparations or nah? And if you say yes, what do reparations look like? Come on, why are you doing this? You talking about that was an easy one. That is an easy if I'm, one. If I'm president for 30, 30 days, days. Will I, would I give reparations? Yes. And if so, what would that look like? I don't, I don't think I would give reparations. And the reason why I wouldn't give reparations is because I feel like 93% of the demographic that would be receiving those reparations Mm-hmm will lose focus in sight of the goal. Because when you're given something, it's just like you forget about everything else. But if you work for it, it'll be there forever. So I, I would be a hard president, I'm not gonna lie. People, <laughs> I don't think people will like, people don't like me now and I don't got, but, but then that goes back to the whole power thing and the love thing, you know? Yeah. So I feel like if, you, if you're um, that person that is the the leader or like the you know yeah the captain of the ship or the leader like you can't be scared to rub people the wrong way. Mm. So yeah, I'm not giving no reparations. Mm-mm. You think it's gonna look like Dave Chappelle's vision <laughs> of reparations? Did you ever see that episode? Um, was was it on the Chappelle show? Yes. You know what's so crazy? <laughs> I'm gonna tell you something, right? I. And people kill me for this. Mm. I I never really watched the Chappelle show. I'm a Martin guy. Oh. Martin is my show. Martin, you know, um, maybe sometimes the Wayans Brothers, maybe sometimes the Fresh Prince, maybe sometimes the Jamie Foxx show. But like I can tell you every word and every line and every scene of every Martin episode. Like that was my show. Mm. Martin, the Boondocks is my other go-to. Of course. Um, Family Guy. Mm-hmm. Shark Tank is one of my other favorite shows. And sports, of course. And cooking shows. And The Flavor of Love. Me and my grandmother's favorite show was The Flavor of Love. I that was me and my grandmother's show. Totally. I wish my Nana would have got to see that. I think she'd enjoyed that <laughs> so much. And Cops. Me and my grandmother. That, that was our three shows. Cops. Flavor of Love. And drivers dives and dines with Guy Guy Fieri, where mm-hmm. he goes all around the world and stops at different restaurants. Those are all three shows right there. Yeah, definitely. You're producing your own bio epic. Twenty eight year old Cream walks in. What's your theme song? Introducing you on the screen. Oh, Jay Z. Um, 
Dun, 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 dun. Uh, what's that song, Space? What's the name? Um, the Rock Boys in the Building tonight. Mm. Oh, what a feeling I'm feeling. That, depending on, like, I'm telling you, I'm different people, different days. And then Kanye, la, 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 wait till I get my money, right? That one. And then um, I got a lot of songs. Um, <laughs> um hmm. Young Thug might be one day, Future might be another day, but let's just stay with Kanye and Hov. I'm going to just stay with Kanye and Hov. Kanye and Hov. Yeah. Great, great picks. Yeah. Define gangster. Hmm. To, to condense my long answer, my long winded answer, um, gangster is just doing what you say you're going to do. Wherever, wherever that might fall, if you say you're gonna do something, you gotta do it. You gotta, like my uncle always say, we from the show me state, we from Missouri, you gotta show me. Whatever it is, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna get that, I'm gonna, that's gangster to me. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta do what you say you're gonna do. So, in, in my short, condensed, straight to the point answers, you just gotta be a man of your word. Show and prove. Mm hmm. Absolutely. And that is Supreme Junior, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It has been you. a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. God bless. Hey, yo. You remember those commercials when we was kids? They used to talk about the effects of marijuana and how it affects the brain and memory and it, all those things. Look, we could go in every store right now and buy it, on every corner, in every neighborhood. And it's been 15 years since I've been smoking. And it ain't never do nothing to me. I'm completely fine, normal. Junior? Did you make it to the interview today? Yes, Ma. No, no. Um, I, I, I rescheduled the interview. They said I could call them in the morning. I got everything rescheduled. It's all right, Ma. Everything is okay. Marijuana can make nothing happen for you, too. I got to get off the game. I'll call you right back. Everything is all right, Ma. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Bigger Picture the throne room. As always, I thank the Lord that I've been blessed another day to come before you and speak to you guys. On this episode of some things that I want to touch on. It's something that we are often dealing with right now in society that many of us is faced with. And that's the understanding of the Christian. Many of you have been mocked. Many of you have been ridiculed on taking on the banner of a Christian. There's a lot of confusion in the world between the so-called religion, Christianity, and what a Christian is. And today, we're going to take the time out to dig a little bit into that and give some more true enlightenment to Christians. So, one of the main arguments is that given is that Christianity is a Roman religion. Let's dig into that. So first of all, let's start where this all comes from. You had someone by the name of Abram. Abram was given a promise and a covenant for God that his seed shall be exceedingly great and that his covenant would be in his seed. Abraham had a son. His son's name was Isaac. 
Isaac had a son. And his son name was Jacob. Jacob's name was later turned to Israel. Jacob had 12 sons. And that came to be the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, were they Romans? Of course not. You could already see and do your study that Abraham actually originally comes out of Africa, but was later moved into the land, Judah. And that built the people that we know now as the 12 tribes of Israel. So what they will actually be is Jews, Hebrews. So, where do we get Christian from? How did that terminology even come about? Did it come from the Romans? What was the Romans during the time of Christ? A Christian? Let's dig into that. Again, we have to look and see where did the whole terminology of Christian come from? And when it came, what was it meant? What was the desire of that name given? So in order for us to analyze that, we must first look at Scripture and see what the Scripture speaks to us. If you go to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16 says, Yet any man suffer, one as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So, let not any, so, if any man suffer as a Christian, hmm, and this is in Peter, so now we have to go further and see again, where is this Christian coming from? Let's go to the book of Acts, chapter 11, verse 26. And when he found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass the whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Who were the disciples? Was the disciples Hebrews? Was the disciples of Israel? When you do your study, you will find out that yes. So, let's look at that. The disciples were the first to be called Christians. Who are the disciples? The disciples was those that followed Jesus and was taught directly by him in his manifestation of the flesh here on earth. So I know this gives you a question to say, well, Bigger, where did the Christianity come from? Where did that come from? How did that come about? Okay. That we have to look into. Jesus prophesied something before his death that was going to happen, and that was called the destruction of Jerusalem. And we have to analyze the scripture and see exactly what did he say about the destruction of Jerusalem. 
What did he say that would happen? Who destroyed Jerusalem? Why did they destroy Jerusalem? Was the teachings of Christ somehow a threat to the government? Was Jesus not a threat to the government before he was even born in the physical flesh? Hmm. These are the things that we have to analyze here and we have to get down to. So, if we go to Mark 13, let's look through Mark 13 and see what Jesus has to say. If you look at Mark 13, 6, he prophesies and he says to the disciples, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. Who did that? <laughs> Who did that? He said, many shall come in my name. Take on the banner. Did that happen? Let's see here. Was there not a war after Jesus' death? About 300 years A.D. with someone called Constantine, Roman emperor. Hmm. What did Constantine and his soldiers do? Did they not take on the banner of Christianity? Did they not come under the Christian flag, which started the whole Roman Christianity? But were they Christians? See, this is where it gets good. And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes. He's talking about a war that's happening. Was Constantine at war? Hmm. Who was Constantine at war with? Better yet, did Constantine persecute Christians? Hmm. When you do your study, you will see that Constantine was the first emperor that actually persecuted certain Christians. The same one who took on the banner of Christianity and had his soldiers put on the mark of the cross. But was he that? You see, the scripture already said to you, and Jesus already forewarned you, that many was going to come in his name. But are they Christians? What is it to be a Christian? We got to go back to Antioch. So when the disciples arrived in Antioch, Antioch would be like a modern day New York, modern day LA. When they arrived there with the teachings and started teaching the people, they wasn't called Christian in a good way at first. It was a mockery. It meant baby Christ. Look at these little baby Christ. Look at these little baby Christ. So 
So what does that tell you? The word Christian is truly an adjective. So if it's an adjective, that means it's a description. If you do not fit the description, how could you be a Christian? You see, these are the things that we have to get into. These are the things that we have to stand against. Because there are true people out there that have given their lives to the Lord, like many of you that are watching this and understand what I'm saying and understand inside that they strive to be Christian. But there are those that make mockery to this day and try to bring you down and try to associate you with something that is not to be associated with. If they truly studied the scripture and understood what the scripture speaks, they would already understand that this is a separation here. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. So, we have to look at that extremely. In order to be Christian, being Christ-like, I've heard it said, and it's been argued that, oh, you had the Christian warriors that was killing people. Did I just not explain that the Romans took on Christianity, and that's how you have what you know now as the Roman church. But were they the Christians? Did they even continue to persecute the real Christians after that? All of this, I need you to go into your books, I need you to study. I need you to look it up because this is very real. These are things and these are matters that we argue about every day. We debate every day. And God is speaking to us in scripture and he tells you these things beforehand. Now, I want to explain some things. We all fall short of the glory of the Lord, all of us. And we all should be striving for perfection. The difference is, is that when you want to give your life to the Lord, you become and repent of your sins. You don't justify your sins. You understand that your sins keep you separated from God. You repent on your sins and you give your life over to him. This is the gospel. Scripture says thou shalt not murder. That was one of the commandments. So if you were murdering, would you be a Christian? Does it go together? No. It doesn't. And again, it is something that is described. So I myself would never stand here before you and tell you that I'm a Christian. That's what the people said from my description. I would tell you that I'm a work in progress. And I always want you to understand that. I'm a work in progress. I'm striving for perfection. I cannot take what I know to be true and ignore the truth and come to the people with lies. Now,
getting back to who is a Christian? A Christian would be one that is in repentance of their sins and have turned over their life to the Lord. That's what a Christian is. Someone who is striving for perfection. Someone who is in repent for their sins and have the testimony of Jesus Christ who we know died on the cross for our sins. Now, that gets so large and I realize that it's going to take many sermons and many times for me to come to this to explain how this all works out. And I will, and I'm dedicated to it. But I want the people to have an understanding as what is said in the beginning. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. The scripture tells us already that they will make mockery of us, that we will be despised by this world. Very interesting. Does the Bible say that the devil has the ability to make himself like a light form? The devil has the ability to make himself appear to be what's correct? What did the Romans do? What did Constantine do? Or how much blood was on their hands? So now you understand that the people who originally was called Christians were the disciples of Christ. If you are today a disciple of Christ, that means you follow him. And if you follow him, you need not be ashamed to be called a Christian. We'll do something deeper. Like I said, it's going to take a long time to explain this, and I'm dedicated for it. Your bloodline. It's your bloodline. Who you are. Do you really think Romans created the scriptures? The scriptures was around way before. You think the slave masters, which they all love to say, oh, the slave master, you the slave master religion. Have you read the scripture? I mean, literally, let's stop with this nonsense. Have you read the scripture? A slave master's religion? If you understood the Bible, the whole entire scripture speaks totally against the emperors, Caesar, and everything else. So how could that be? Mm, now we get into it. Was something taken from you that was already a part of your bloodline and your people and used against you? See where it's going? And now you walk around and you deny your own self. What did your mother believe in? What did your grandmother believe in? What did your great grandmother believe in? Generations and generations and generations. But you expect us to believe, oh, that was taught to them by 
these Romans Or did the Romans use something that they knew that the people believed in already and use it to control them? Let's dig deep. Why did Constantine? Why did Constantine take on the flag? Who was he at war with? I just told you earlier that Constantine persecuted Christians. They will later tell you that after he took on the Christian banner, that he was the first emperor to stop the persecution. I want you to dig deeper and see that he was the emperor that was actually persecuting what I told you earlier, certain Christians. As the scripture I already told us, that time was going to come. Let's dig more deeper and see what was some of Jesus' prophecy about that time. In Mark 13, it says, 22, for false Christ and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Who are the elect? Another word for the Christians? What happens 300 years after Jesus' death? Talk about it. The rise of Constantine. That's when the Roman government took on the Christian banner. This is where you get the confusion. At. This is where it's not understood. I beckon you people to pause. Take the time to open up your scriptures and read more. Everything that is in that book is profitable for you. And I need you to understand. We are all one. We are all children of God. We all have To restore our minds because that's where we've been all attacked at. We've all been attacked through our minds. Now we don't even accept who Christ is. No. The sacrifice that was made for us so that we could see redemption. This is only the first time I will speak on this, but as I told you, I'm dedicated and I understand that this is layers and layers and layers that I have to take you through. And I praise the Lord that he's given me the strength, he's given me the stature to stand for it. And I will be here for you and I will always be here to take you through it. And to show you and to try to fix some of these misunderstandings that been given to our children and given to you. So before I wrap this up, I want you to remember that Christian is to be Christ-like. In order to be Christ-like, you have to be like Christ. If you don't know who Christ and how his earthly mannerism was, you 
need to open up the book. Read the disciples. Not the Old Testament. And it's a reason for that. The people that left the footprints according to the scripture for us to follow were the disciples. So don't tell me about Solomon, many wives. Don't tell me about David, many wives. Don't tell me about the concubines. Because you know what I'm going to tell you? Is that consistent with the disciples? I would like to say, everyone, God evening. God is great. I love you. And um, those that have been following the platform and support me, I can't begin to tell you. When I see you in the street and you stop me, which is all the time, that means everything to me. It's you that gives me the energy to keep going. It's you that gives me the energy to come before you to try to work out some of this, some of, some, some of all of this, because ultimately it falls on the minister. God have given certain ones of us the ability to speak the truth. I told you I was a work in progress. Before I wrap it up, I will share this with you. There was a prophet by the name of Jonah. God wanted Jonah to go into the land of Nivea and minister to the people. Nivea, like Antioch, you could compare it to a modern day New York, LA, Chicago, many centers living in the world. Lost in the darkness. God told Jonah, I need you to go over there and minister to those people. Because it is the duty. Warn the wicked of thy evil ways that thou shalt surely die. <laughs> But if I don't warn the wicked of their evil ways, that thou shall surely die. They're going to die anyway in their own iniquity. But their blood will be on the hands of those that God gave testimony, to, that God gave the ability to minister the truth, that God gave the foresight their blood would be on their hands. Jonah, he didn't want to go to Nibia. He wanted to live his life a little bit. So what did Jonah do? Jonah decided to try to escape the voice of the Lord. Jonah tried to escape his responsibility. He said, damn Nivea, God. Damn Nivea. I want you to bring destruction on them. Destroy them. I want you to bring destruction on them. Let your wrath come. I don't want to go over there. I don't want to deal with that. Even. It wasn't his choice. But he didn't want to deal with it. He wanted to probably take a relax. He wanted to take a break. He wanted to live a little bit. Jonah goes and he gets on the ship. And in his mind, he's going to take a trip total opposite to where the Lord has sent him to go. 
He's going to try to escape the voice of God and live and try to do his own thing. I'm going to go down here to this ship. I'm going to kick back, <laughs> relax. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Let God deal with that. You know what I'm saying? But I'm going to take a break. I'm going to lay up. What happened? The ship sails out. Goes to where it's going. And in the night, the ship's crew becomes deadly afraid because the wind started to turn over the ship. The wind is blowing so hard, it's going to turn over the ship. The crewmen don't know what's going on. They're doing their best to try to save the ship and try to stop the ship from going over water. Where's Jonah? He laid up downstairs like... Escape. Get away. I tried to avoid... But God is going to bring it right back to me. Because Jonah is a prophet. Jonah knows exactly what the Lord has in order for him and what he is supposed to be doing. He knows that he has went against the voice of the Lord. So he comes up to the ship. See the ship getting turned over. Everybody crying. Is he going to stay on the ship and ignore and act like this is not all because of him? Is he going to again try to somehow escape his responsibility when obviously the ship is going to turn over and kill all of those people? The Jonah says to the crew, it's me, me, this is all happening because of me, you got to throw me off the ship. The crew didn't want to believe, they're like, what is this man talking about? You know what I'm saying, what nonsense are you talking about, you know? And they keep going to try to save and stop the wind from turning over the ship, doing the best they can, but it's not working. They realize maybe what he's saying is the truth. Off the ship, Jonah goes. When Jonah gets thrown off the ship, he's swallowed by the well. All of this is very significant to you. He swallowed by the well and finds himself in the belly of the beast. For three days, three nights. That's significant too. Who else did a three day, three nights? We'll deal with that later. What did Jonah do when he got in the belly of the beast? He immediately repented. He repented because he knew. This was because of me. I tried to avoid God. I was supposed to do what I was supposed to do. He repented. He repented. And on the third day, he was spit out the well. When he was spit out the well, guess where he was at? Guess where the well just happened to spit him out on? The land of Nivea. Mind you what I told you, the ship was going opposite of Nivea. Tell you that story to explain to you that story. 
It's always on the ministers. It's always on the prophet to bring forth the truth. It's always a great responsibility to warn the wicked of their evil ways. In many ways, most of my life I was Jonah. To my sad regret. Like I told you, I'm a work in progress. I just wanted to live. Times I ignored the gospel, knowing it was the truth, knowing to the minister, knowing that I had to set things straight, but <laughs> probably wanted to watch a rap video. I wanted to chill. I just probably wanted to go in the bottom of the ship and ignore it. Take a nap. Can't do that anymore. I look at the world and I look at everything around me. Clear. Where's the minister? Where's the prophet? This whole entire misunderstanding has been done because at some, some point or another, we dropped the ball. I dropped the ball. Can't do that anymore. As I told y'all from the beginning, I'm here to represent what's right. I'm here to represent the line of Judah, which is Christ. I am a CCA Academy Christ Crusader soldier. I love you all. Salute. And we are back. Welcome to another episode of The Bigger Picture. The In the Throne Room. We are here with Sean Bigger, our most esteemed guest. And we are now going to drift into part two of the makings of the man of God. How are you this morning, Your Grace? God is good. God woke me up on another morning to be able to greet the people and try to right some of the wrongs that I've done in life. And that is always a joyous moment. There's always something that, um, it's a blessed moment every day that we wake up. Every day, everyone wakes up. We are all blessed because we wake up to the breath of life. And the breath of life is God. And that's a blessing. Amen to that. We're going to pick right back up where we left the theme song that is playing at that particular moment is Criminal Minded. Criminal Minded, you've been blinded. We're in high school now. Let's delve into your first exposure to organized chaos. Um... Let's talk about the Decepticons. That is, um, for all of you who are millennials, you when you hear Decepticons, you may think about the Transformers and all of the stars and the special effects. But once upon a time in New York City, there was an organization um, known as the Decepticons, and some of their antics and activities were being played on the news on a bi-nightly basis. So can you share with us your experience with the Decepticons? All right, so um, at this time that skips forward into a lot, so we have to, we have to, see what got me to the Decepticons. So um, what started all of that? Again, I don't, these, um, I'm doing this because I do understand that my story will impact so many people, but I take no pride in my past. It actually brings tears to me. Um, I was a victim as I explained to you guys before, and I was a victim for so long that I guess it did something to me. And the point to be a part of something where I wasn't the victim 
Hurt people hurt people. That's very, very real. And I happen to be a product of that. So when we got off last time, I'm fresh back in New York. I'm at, you know, the high school where I'm, I'm a nerd. I'm Urkel. I don't have jeans, sneakers, nothing the other kids have. I talk very proper, you know, straight from private school, straight A student. Um, and as I told you now, I'm with Chris and Corey. The brothers. The brothers. So that year, after the classroom, I was just so happy to have found a niche. I found some guys that would be there for me because I hadn't really experienced that in my life. Where I came from, again, like I told you, the guys that I grew up with was cut from the same cloth as I was. So it was no, you know, and then even them, they didn't, you know, help me. You know, it was just, I was by myself, you know, so. That was the first experience of just brotherhood. So I started being with Chris and Corey and, you know, these guys every day, you know, they crew, their individual crew. And like I told you, me and Corey became actually best friends um, when they took me in. Now, they were tough, extremely tough, but they were well seasoned and they were Harlem guys. So Harlem guys was very different around that time. Harlem was always about his money. You know what I'm saying? It was never kind of, you know, it wasn't too much wow, you know, like, you know, on a gang type of aspect. You know, they was more about money. The blocks and the guys was more about making money. From what I could observe at that time, because mind you, I'm a kid, green to the whole situation. But that's how Corey and, you know, his brother and those guys was. They wasn't um, troublemakers. You know, they wasn't uh, gang guys or anything like that. They was just tough. Nobody messed with them, you know, and they was from the element. So I was with them every day. And they didn't go to class. We didn't go to class. You know, that was, you know, the whole thing back then was to um, hang in the lunchroom and, you know, and different things like that. So I think I had um, fell victim of that, you know, being so happy to hang with the brotherhood. And um, I wasn't going to class being with these guys. And I haven't even went to a school that had a structure like that. That was another thing. I didn't even understand how could you cut class? How could the teacher tell us if we want to leave, we could leave? I never had even experienced anything like that. Like, if you didn't show up to class in private school, you know, their teachers was on the phone with your parents that day. And there was no Exactly. So the, the teacher said to us that day that if y'all don't want to be here, y'all can leave. The door is right there. It was an open door for kids to leave. We're children. How we have that much power to make decisions whether we want to be a part of school or not? That was a new experience for me, you know? But like I said, I was enjoying being with the guys and being with the fellas, you know? Um, and um, that was something f impactful for me. So that led me away from being in class. Now, at the same time that I'm fresh back home in New York, and I'm being with Chris and Corey, the guys that's actually in my building, you know, um, the couple guys that were already to the street that, you know, before I was, you know, that I grew up with, you know, um, have now finally started to take notice with me. And maybe because I'm at the age at 14, Again, at 14, I'm probably like six, five, you know, it, you know, it was a lot for my mom to probably deal with. And now that I look in the past, that, you know, she, that was probably 
uh, you know, the overwhelming stage for her because she didn't have the full control as what she had before to just tell me I couldn't go outside and play with the other kids. So now, yeah, I'm going outside and I'm trying to mingle with the other kids, the same kids that, you know, all my life would be teasing me, jumping me, you know, and that basically I was at war with these same kids I'm trying to associate with because, again, these are my neighborhood, you know, uh, I wouldn't say neighborhood friends, but they are my neighbor. They're the guys that's in the neighborhood that I did, you know, grow up seeing. We all grew up, you know, seeing each other. So, yeah, you know, of course, you want to, you know, be familiar with the guys that are close to your age. So, yeah, around that age, I started hanging with those guys as well, trying to find my way pretty much. So, in school, I'm with Corey, and then after school, now, when I come home, the couple guys in my neighborhood that I'm trying to, you know, become a part of that, you know, I'm trying to be with them. So they were popular too. They were from the element as well. So um, during that time, I think I started, um, it was a, School in Harlem called IS-10, and everybody know what I'm talking about. That was a public school. It wasn't my school, it was a school in Harlem. But at this point, I'm cutting school. And then Dwayne, my best friend, my brother, my everything, he started cutting school in the high school he was in. So now, we're hooking up together every day at his house, you know, cutting school. And we have, again, my friends that is from my building, my family, my cousins, actually, you know, um, because sometimes relationships, as you know, go deeper than even us, our parents are connected to each other in some way. So sometimes you might not be blood related, but you can't be. Still family. Exactly. You can't be no more blood related. So I have people like that in my family that are my family, you know, um, and that I'm talking about that come from that element. That at that time, now I'm connecting with that, you know, we grew up together, but they were of the element before I was. They was able to go outside and play as kids when I wasn't. So now I'm hanging out with them. They have the ties to IS-10. They have the ties to the street. They have the ties to the element. I'm just starting to be able to even be with them. So IS-10 is right downstairs from Espinar Gardens, which is where, you know, Dwayne lives. So one day when we're cutting school, we go downstairs and we happen to see all the guys, you know, from my building. You know, you see, you know, my family. We see my guys I grew up with from my building. Like, what's going on? You know what I'm saying? Now I'm putting together, he go to school. That's his school, you know? And they there with just a massive, massive amount of Harlem guys that were just destructive, misguided, hurt people themselves. A posse. A posse is what we were. And I never forget it. It was amazing. It was just like. Again, me and Dwayne were the same. We private school kids. This was our first year in public school, and we were probably cutting public school because it was overwhelming for us. We couldn't handle it. You know, we should have never been there. Um, the access to freedom. Yes, was it was overwhelming. It was overwhelming for the both of us. We should have not been there. We should have both went. Should have not argued with our parents who went back to Rice because that's where his parents really wanted to originally put him to. 
but we didn't want to go to the all boys school. And we was tired. We was thinking we was tired of private school, the uniform, the suits all the time. The you know, structure. Yeah, you know, which that was a big mistake. But um, that day, of course, they embraced us because again, these are like my family. These are my act like my cousins. So they like chill with us, roll with us, see how we do. So me and Dwayne, yeah, we'll be with you guys. It's like 50, 60 of these guys. We start going through our Harlem and everywhere and everywhere we're going. These guys is beating the shit out of people, robbing people, you know, just taking stuff. We go to 125th Street, people start running for their life when we go to 125th Street. The Africans selling the bootleg stuff, start packing up their stuff, running. It was a known thing. Like, as soon as we would hit the block, people would know, run. You know what I'm saying? And it would just be nothing but all us wild kids just running, hurting people. You know what I'm saying? And the first day, it was so many of them, and it was so much going on. I would never forget me and Dwayne. We talk about this often. Again, we're both 14. We step off the train that day. And we both looked at each other. And there was so much going on, we really couldn't embrace each other and talk at that moment. Because again, it's like 50, 60 guys, and they're trashing everything around them. And I actually, again, I have penny loafers on, you know what I'm saying? I have on the dress pants, the button-up shirt, because that's all I type of clothes I have. And you know, you know, um, and you know, just these guys are just going. So me and Dwayne look at each other and we give each other the look like, you know what I'm saying? Whoa, bro. Are we safe this over our head? Like, we don't, you know what I'm saying? We don't know nothing. These guys is hurting people. This is deep stuff. So we looked at each other and we just like, you know, we got to get back to the house, get back to the crib when this is over and figure this out. So when the day was over and me and him went back to the house, we made a pact that we wasn't going to be the sheep. You know what I'm saying? Like, these dudes is wolves. These dudes is straight wolves. They wolves, and this is what it is in life. We grew up watching wolves, and now we got a chance to be kind of associated with some wolves, and we seen firsthand, because we always saw the wolves on the outside, but now we was actually was in the pack. And we seen like, oh man, this is how it goes down. You know, this is what it's really about. And all we decided was we looked at each other and we made a pact with each other that we wasn't going to be the sheep anymore. We wasn't going to be the sheep. You know what I'm saying? And that they changed a lot in my life. You know what I'm saying? So now fast forward and how do we get to the Decepticons? You know, I don't like naming names because, you know, um, that's a form of incriminating people that did not sign up for that. So, you know, I would never name names. That's something that goes on on social media and stuff like that. I wouldn't do that. If I name someone named, it's because that's my brother and I wouldn't be naming their name in any type of way to incriminate them in any crime or any, or even a life story that they wouldn't want told. They would have to be in agreement with that. So anybody that I'm not naming names, this is why I don't, you know, you have to be in agreement with that. So. Again, at that time, the leader of, you know, the Harlem, you know, structure that I was a part of at that time, that was the, that was, you know, pretty much controlling the whole 60 guys. It was several, it would be like two or three leaders, you know, but, you know, they all, you know, one of them was my family, you know, and then another one, was, you know, a, another guy that I, to this day, I'm extremely very close to. He knows what I'm, what I'm talking about when he watches. He's my, 
you know, he's my brother as well. They all took very close to me, even though, and I never understood it, even though I was a nerd. I didn't even have regular clothes or, and I was so green, you know, I didn't know nothing about the street or anything, but you know, I don't know, they all, I, that was one blessing too that God always gave me, people always took to me. He started going to high school. He was in high school and the high school that he went to was Park West. And Park West was, as those that know, was a home, a, a big part of the home for the group of guys that you just named. Now, my guy, he changed his life now, and I'm so proud of him. I'm so proud of you. But he was a terrorist back then. He was a killer. You know what I'm saying? He was, he was a killer. He was, a, you know, a, a very dark entity. Dark entities connect with dark entities. So I guess when he got to Park West, they took to him. You know, they already, you know, he immediately took, they must have took to him because he became a part of them. And when he became a part of them, he called every from the 60-man crew that he already had running in Harlem. He called his close ones, which I would be one of them, you know what I'm saying, and um, to come be with him over there. So, and that was, a, that was a, that's how we got to the Decepticons. So later when he caused us to come to Park West to meet up with him and start being with him with these guys, that's how that, whole thing started and that was or and that was we had I had already now by now experienced the running with the 50 60 guys running throughout the city going to different high schools beating up people going everywhere throughout the street just beating up people for nothing you know and taking what they had I had already experienced that but when I got to Park West and got with those guys, we went from like 50 to, man, it was over 100 of us. It was so many guys that you could not, see. all right, so if you wasn't in the front of the pack, you wouldn't get any action if you was in the middle or behind because the people, by the time you walked past, it would just be people laid out and all type of, stuff and these guys was um it was just that was just a different level of hurt and um that was again another time i regret i regret i regret i regret i regret because again hurt people hurt people i knew that that was not who i was that's not who i wanted to be that's not you know that's not who I was or wanted to be. But I, I think was, again, affected by my upbringing so much, by being a victim, I, you know, and now to be on the other side and to be learning, that's what it was. Can you describe coming home after... Um a day of deliberate chaos with that group because the Septicons was primarily made up of teenagers and the level of destruction, violence, it almost moved as a terrorist organization throughout the five boroughs. Um, when you would see those stories on the news, on the front of the Daily News, the New York Post, all I'm of the, part of something. the exactly all of the publications, because there wasn't like you said, the group was so large they weren't law enforcement wasn't even able to identify who the members were because, as you said, when they would show up at any high school, it would be almost like a cloud, a sea 
of almost faceless entities, right? So when you would get home after your day, having not gone to school, having been a part of it, what was that like when you would see uh, Decepticons allegedly, you know, assaulted this person, um, knowing that law enforcement was actively creating a division to stamp this entity out. What was you? What were some of the thoughts that came in your mind when you would see it in the media? Well, at that age again, when I would get away from them, we would. I would think about. For me, I would think about the hurt people a lot more than anything. Um, the images live with me to this day. And God, that was almost like um, a punishment from God because what he was allowing me to see was myself. He allowed me to look at people afterwards because I wasn't really, you know, but like I said, it, it was so many guys. You, it wasn't like that. You had to be in it because it was going to happen regardless. It was so many, so it was like I was always more of a spectator, but a spectator. No, you know, still was in the mix, you know? So it's not like I wasn't in the mix, but I wasn't so much, you know, the one that might might have been kicking, stomping, stabbing, or doing any of that, but yeah, I'm still in the group. So I still get to look. Mm -hmm. And I, again, like I said, if you was in the middle or behind, mm -hmm. the action was already done. So by the t so you just basically walking by looking at spread out victims everywhere and the faces and the hurt and what was taken from them was what was taken from me. So yeah, of course, I would see stuff on the news a lot. It was a lot of stuff like that. I don't know what I was going through at that time. You know, I was going through, again, hurt people being, hurting people. And me being, having the opportunity to be a part of some guys that, you know, all my life I probably might have and somewhat looked up to and wanted to play with and go outside and associate with or see what they was doing, but I wasn't allowed to. You know what I'm saying? And now I have the opportunity now to, you know, be with these guys and on a different level and um, see deeper inside of them. And again, they were hurt kids. You know, they were all hurt kids, all had situations that I couldn't imagine in that my mom had protected me from. These guys' mothers was drug addicts. They didn't know their fathers. You know what I'm saying? They come from criminal families. This was all the stuff that I was protected from. So I was getting close. I was able to see, whoa, this is the reality of all of these guys' lives. And they went back home. They were going back home to homes because we go visit each other homes that I can understand. You know, like it was a secret, like like a. How can you tell your friend, your mom, your mom, your mom? You know what I'm saying? Like, how could you say that? And I'm at the, your house that I could clearly see. That's what you don't got no furniture. You know what I'm saying? You don't got. You know what I'm saying? So, mm, yeah, you know, that experienced me to see all of those things. And, yeah, you know, see that the pe those, it was more to what meet the eye. So God was allowing me to see 
it from a level that I didn't see it from as a child. I mean that these kids, other kids that clearly I thought were demons, you know what I'm saying? And you know, it was a reason. It was a reason why they were like that. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a time that the conversation came up at home? No. Um, because it was just so all over. No. I, again, my mom was losing fast control at that time. You know what I'm saying? She was losing um, fast control, you know, um, because I was so big and probably so fast that she couldn't just snap her finger and make me do what she wanted me to do anymore. She couldn't come out side with the belt when the sun went down, <laughs> you know how she used to do. <laughs> you know, it was those things that changed. Yeah, I had one of those mothers that when the sun went down, if I wasn't upstairs, she was outside embarrassing me with the fur coat on, you know, coming outside with the belt. And mind you, I wasn't able to leave the green gates. So I was still in the development of the protected zone that I come from, you know, but I had to be upstairs in the house before sundown. But now I'm 14, you know, I'm back from, you know, living with my aunt and uncle, which was supposed to work, but it didn't, you know, and it's overwhelming things, you know, things, you know, um, so yeah, it was became overwhelming. No, I didn't speak to my mom much about any of the, anything that was going on. It was already known from before that the whole reason I was sent upstate was for the element that was New York City. So I just think at that point, I don't know, maybe she was dealing with it a lot with God and prayer. And I know that's what it probably, you know, was, but no, we didn't speak much. And they didn't know what was going on with me in school. Because again, public schools don't tell. You know, public schools don't tell. So my parents had a wall poured over their face. They straight A student, straight out of uh, private school education is going to a public school for a whole year. And they don't know that he's not going to class. You know when these they actually called my parents to tell them that I was cutting class. Hmm. You know when they called them and told them? I think they would just send letters. No, nothing. They did not tell them that, contact them and tell them I was cutting school to June. Hmm. Pretty much the completion of the school year. Completion at the end of the year is when they told my parents that I wasn't going to class. Was there a surge of power being a part of the pack, the wolf pack? When you say surge of power, did I feel power? Did you feel a surge of power? Again, the power came from the brotherhood. Right. Okay. The, that, the, the, the being with a group of guys, you know, that, you know, that obviously come from situations, you know, but have made a pact to protect themselves. And just, it's just, just communion alone, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? That's a, yeah, that's power, just to be with the brothers in the communion and you know, at that time when you were a kid, you know, that's, yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's where I would have felt the surge of power that you're speaking of. And this, and a surge of power also comes with, again, um, If, so I understand the mentality of so many of the youth. If you, if you associate yourself with this, maybe 
the wolves won't come for you. You know what I'm saying? If, you know, you associate yourself somehow with them. You know what I'm saying? You, you know, so that's something that, you know, is, is always, you know, it's, a, it's definitely power to, I guess, be in the wolf pack. In safety. Exactly. And to be in, was in the wolf pack is some form of power. I want to um, just move a little bit because this is all around the same time period. Um, the nation of gods and earths. All right, so this is what comes up right next. So that year, when well, I said- first, share with our, our audience, because the nation of gods and earths was so pivotal um, for the late 60s and 70s babies. I don't know if there's an understanding of what that was um, for us, the babies of the Panthers, the babies of the NOI, the babies of the movement of civil rights. I don't know if they, if our audience really truly understands what the Nation of Gods and Earths was, how we got a Rakim Allah, how we got a Supreme Team. Um, could you just share a little bit about what that was, the Nation of Gods and Earths? All right, so um, the Nation of Gods and Earths comes from, um, all right, so you have 5% of the population of the planet Earth that are the poor righteous teachers. The nation of gods and earths are of the 5% part of the population of the planet Earth. That they teach that the black man is God. Um, the white man is the devil. Um, and um, it spans off from the nation of Islam with Elijah Muhammad and Clarence 13X um, and Malcolm X. Uh, the lessons that they have, the 120 lessons, is written by Master Farad and Elijah Muhammad. They're basically questions and answers. When Clarence 13 X left from with Malcolm X, he started his own. He took the 120 lessons and started what you have now as the nation of gods and earths, which their base is located in Harlem on 127th Street. And now getting the speed how that all comes about. Uh, again, at the time in June, the school hadn't told my parents yet that I wasn't going to class. They just finally told them in June. So when they told them in June, I was given an ultimatum to either, you know, Either I'm got to go to class, you know, or, you know, um, I can't stay there, you know. Um, and I had, um, at the time, was hanging out with my other friends that was from the building. That was pretty much my family. Their mom was staying in, in the projects over in St. Nick Projects, which is right next to the Nation of Gods and Nerves. Um, so I just was like, look, I'm gonna go hang out with them for the summer and stay over there at their house, you know, to avoid my mom, my dad with, you know, this, you know, stuff. And I'm already getting out there, you know, so I just want to hang with them, you know, be with them. Cause again, I just love the brotherhood, you know? So I started staying over there, staying with them pretty much. Now I had always saw the school, but I used to actually think it was a Muslim mosque because I didn't know, I'm 14, I don't know what, you know, it was yet. So um, I walked past it a lot. 
So now that I'm in St. Nick, staying there that whole summer, I'm constantly walking by it every day. And it was always on my mind because my private school is just a few blocks from there. So mm -hmm. I always saw this place. So around that time, you know, being the Bible thumper I was going to school, me and my best friend Dwayne, at this age, of course, we started probably challenging a lot of stuff that we were reading in the Bible and going to school with around Chuck. And earliest 11, 12 years old, me and him was already challenging a lot of that stuff. And um, during that time, I had came up with the idea at maybe as early as 11 that I had it figured out that, you know, I was God. And even though it might not be understood, you know what I'm saying, my ed my mind and my education as far as what I had learned, that's what it had added up to me, you know, saying, wait, so I'm God. That's what it must be. So I was already thinking in that mentality for a few years before I even knew there was a nation of gods and earths. So now, fast forward this day, I'm walking past, and I stopped this day and I asked him, "What is this? This is a what? What's the, what is this place?" And the brother said, "This is the nation of gods and earth." I like what? That's a Muslim mosque, you know what I'm saying? He said, "No." He said, "No, the the black man is God," or you know. So I said. I don't really know so much about the black man being God, but I'm God. So, you know what I'm saying? So this sounds interesting, you know what I'm saying? I will be, Intriguing. yeah, I'm, I'm willing now to, you know, you can speak further, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I can listen and that, um, uh, shout outs to my enlightener, a do Allah, who was actually the top of the food chain, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? He was the lieutenant of the FOA, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And someone very powerful within the nation. Everybody that know the name, I just said, no, yeah, he, that was who I was speaking to. He became my enlightener and he brought me in as that 14 year old kid and started teaching me, you know what I'm saying? And uh, giving me the lessons, gave me the lessons and um, I became a part of now, oh wow, that was, I became a part of another brotherhood that was something different that helped pull me actually away from what I was doing up until that point with the games. These are men now. These are men now. These are, these are, these are, these yeah, are warriors. These are men. Absolutely. There is... Um, when we think about the presence of the gods and earths today, you know, from um, Erica Badu to, I don't think the youth now understand how many lives the nation of gods and earths saved, the intent of saving, the intent, the deliberate action of filling those holes. Because as you said, many of the youth were in dark activities, um, not being educated. In order to be enlightened, there was an education that took place. There was reading, there was memorization. You had to be able to recite and know the day's mathematics on Absolutely. site. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you had to know your 120. You had to know your 120. So that was the perfect distraction from those activities because organized chaos is still chaos. There's no lessons being learned. There's no goal. You know, there wasn't a goal. That's what made the Decepticon such a horror. Being enlightened, would you say that was a life-saving moment? No.
No. What would you say? What would you title it as? Exactly what it was. It was enlightenment. Mm. But sometimes, you know, enlightenment don't always come the way you think. Mm. Adam and Eve got enlightenment, you know. Mm -hmm. You know what happened to them when they got enlightenment. Eviction. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> kicked out the garden <laughs> and promised death. Mm -hmm. Pain. You know, yeah, so, no. Life-saving, more like life-ending. Life-ending as I knew it. You know, um, I love the nation of gods and earth, and I'm still, to this day, I always, I can never not be a part of them. I'm too, you know, too, um, those are my brothers. I'm too, too many years, too intricately wrapped into the making of that. When that school burned down, these hands you see, you know what I'm saying? It's a good part of the hands that helped build it back up. Shout outs to Big Daddy Kane. Mm -hmm. When the school burned down, he was the one who came directly to the school and helped give us the money mm -hmm. to buy all the materials and everything to build the school back up. Shout outs to Big Daddy came right there standing with him. The hip hop experience at the time, the nation of God's and earth controlled hip hop. Absolutely. Because every single important person that was rapping was God body. Or fronting. You know what I'm yeah. saying? We had a lot of fronters, but you know what I'm fronters. saying? But everyone wanted to definitely be a part of that mm -hmm. niche. So they actually controlled hip hop. Mm -hmm. So at 14, 15 years old, I became no one knew how old I was. I probably looked it like I look now. You know what I'm saying? I became one of the biggest bodyguards for all the rappers. So here it is now, and that was an amazing experience that was through them. Mm -hmm. Here it is now. I'm 14 years old protecting Big Daddy Kane. I'm protecting Rock Him. The next year, Brand Nubian came out. I'm protecting Brand Nubian. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting with RZA before Wu-Tang, mm -hmm. when he was talking about the plans. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting with Hassan Unique Allah, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, old dirty bastard, mm -hmm. before <laughs> there was a Wu-Tang building with the guy. So yeah, to see, I watched all of that in play, and then again, was they bodyguards when they came when they became successful because they're all protected at that time by the FOA. Mm -hmm. And mind you, I'm high up on the FOA. You know what I'm saying? It's not like I'm one of the, you know, mediocre dudes. So during the nation of God's and at that time, if you ever went to a parliament, if you ever went to anything like that, you had to go through these hands. Mm -hmm. Directly, you know what I'm saying. You know, I, you, I had to directly pat you down coming through those doors. You know, mm -hmm. so I'm again very, you know, high up. When the rappers are uh, doing their shows, I'm right there protecting them on the stage. You know, and that opened up the door in the world of me learning the protection business and protecting high celebrities at a child, but no one knew. Mm -hmm. I was, no one knew I was how old I was. Only, you know, certain of the guys knew, but you know, at that time, I was already being trained in something that, to this day, I try to train some of these guys in. Silence is golden. Mm -hmm. Keep your mouth closed, God. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? When you open up your mouth, you let those know what, you know, they don't know, mm -hmm. know about you that they shouldn't know. Keep your mouth closed. Stay silent. When people do not know anything about you, that puts them more in a fear perspective because they don't know how to come at you. 
So I was mastering that already. Mm -hmm. It worked. No one knew how old I was. Now I actually see the guys, and they be like, "How did you go in the time machine?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, how you like? How you still young? How you still like this? Say, God, I was only fifteen back then. Be like, what? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I was just a kid. You guys was in your twenties. I was fifteen. What was your God body name? <laughs> Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Because so, everyone had to take on a name. So what was, all right, it? was so, it given to you or were you able to select it? I'm going so at first, you know, it was Saquon Allah. And I think that was just because that was as close as to Sean probably is could be possible. You know what I'm saying? Um but after that, you know, it was Savior born Allah. Because I always, um, and that one, you know, I, again, my background, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And um, I always, I always kind of had a feeling that that's what I was came, you know, I mean, those that know me, you know what I'm saying? Know that I was saying that ever since Probably my mom told me when I started to talk, I asked her one time, but that was always with me. I always kind of thought that I was supposed to be a sacrifice for it. I knew I was here to, you know. Was today's mathematics? Well, you caught me off guard with that <laughs> one. <laughs> but wait, you wait, wait, wait. Give me a second. Nobody tell me. You know what I'm saying? Is that... um. Uh, it all goes according to the date, and that is very good because I should be, you should know what today's date is. But since I don't know what today's date is, it's off back, and I don't want to guess and be inaccurate. What is today's date? October 28th. All right, so that would be wisdom built to destroy it, or being born to knowledge cipher, or being born to knowledge. So... It's a breakdown in that, you know. So if today's the 28th, you said? Yes. That's wisdom. Yes. Build or destroy, you know what I'm saying? And it's all being born to knowledge your cipher. Be aware of your cipher. So wisdom, be wise to build. You can take your wisdom and build or destroy Take knowledge to the cipher that's around you, and it's all going to be born to knowledge. So that's how that breaks down. And that even goes to your age, and it goes mm -hmm. to everything like that, and it has very great significance to it when you understand it. It have, does have great significance to it. Very powerful. And we like to close with the theme. We're closing out the chapter of the gods and earth because it has contributed so much to the makings of the man of God and so many of your other experiences. What would be the theme song? For with the that nation chapter. of God's nerves? Mm. At, all right, so again, I, this guy here, I can never really kind of get away from, even though I have stories about him dealing with the nature of God is that wasn't so, you know, you know, nice, but um, I got to go back to, you know, to, you know, um, it, it would be my philosophy. It's still, you mm -hmm. know, it, it, we still under. It's still under the, you know, knowledge reigns knowledge supreme. Reigns supreme. I can't, you yeah, know, right, even right. I can't get around. You know, it was a lot of stuff back then, but knowledge reigns supreme still was kind of, you know, 
the impact of him hadn't died yet. We haven't got to that part yet. You know what I'm saying? His, 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 his influence still was everything at that time, even though, you know, he might have not agreed with the exact, you know, ideology of, you know, the nation of gods and earths. He still was, you know, like the key figure of my thought at that time. And my philosophy was, you know. Powerful. Yeah, it was something. To be continued. <laughs>